Hello, everyone. I'm going to read uh, Hostian Claw again. Navajo Medicine Man and Sand Painter by Frank Johnson Newcomb. You can get this book on Amazon. Uh, we're on chapter nine. Life with an Apache uncle. The results of the Ute raid were not so dis disastrous to the Navajos in Chinicha Valley as in former years. For now, they did not do all their planting in one place. There were glades and meadows on the mountainside that could be irrigated to raise melons, potatoes, and squash, as well as corn. The majority of the sheep were rounded up and brought to the corrals, but most fortunate of all, no one had been killed or hurt, and no woman or children had been taken captive. A small percentage of the corn and beans had not been damaged, so a few families went back to the cornfields, built new shelters, and stayed to harvest this remnant. Estan Sosi and Hostin Nollier decided that this country was too near the Utes and too dangerous for a boy who was now old enough to be riding near and far by himself. Claw's mother had an aunt who had married a Mescalero Apache while at the Bos Bosque Redondo and who now lived on the western slope of the Lucchile Mountains. Packing their horses for a three-day trip, the family of four rode over the pass and along the western slopes to the home of his aunt and her husband. They stayed several days talking over things as Navajos never approach a problem directly, but mention everything else first and carefully pave the way to stating the main object of the visit. Finally, an agreement was reached by which Claw would remain a year or two with these relatives with the status of grandson and his parents would pay for his board with goat sheep and a couple of horses. The aunt and uncle would bring him home for visits two or three times each year and collect the payments. Claw was intrigued with the with new people and new places. He had his pony and his bow and arrows, and he knew he would enjoy exploring the side of the mountains. They did not leave a Dejba here, as she, being a girl and always near her mother, was a little was in little danger of being kidnapped. Besides, her mother needed her help with the sheep and the weaving. Claw soon discovered that this side of the mountains was quite different from the site where he had been living. Only the crests were rocky, then the whole range sloped gradually, but majestically down to glades and mesas where the land was almost level. These soon sheared off and another slope again. It was tree country, but not in the manner he knew, where the cedar, spruce, and pinyon crowded each other in tangled clusters spread their branches close to the ground to hold the moisture and protect the roots. Here the great Norway pines stood far apart with molted trunks like temple pillars standing bare as far as claw could, could reach, then branching thickly the remainder of their height. Even the pinyon and the cedars had now had no low branches but stood quite tall with foliage at the upper part. There was little brush because of the grazing of generations of goats but the slopes were covered with grasses, lupine, horse mint, Indian paintbrush, and more shrubs and plants than he could name. He wished his great aunt could be there to collect and tell them all about them. Every small candy carried a creek winding its way through tangled thickets of willow, pine, cherry, which hazel, sumac, and black haw bushes to form small lakes and marshes, veins in those walls. These never went dry and around them could be found bulrushes, cane grass, cowslips, trillium, and other plants that grow near water. Claw thought this could well be a, a herb gatherer's paradise. The Navajos on the side of the mountain had no need for two dwelling places. Their clusters of hogans were built among the trees at walking distance from their water supply and generally some little distance up the slope above the swells where their farms were located. These farms were not extensive, being patches of slanting land that could be irrigated from the creek, but they were usually productive because there, there had never been a dry season. The flocks were mostly goats, which did not sicken and die in high altitudes. A few sheep were kept for wool, which could be carded with the mohair and the of the goats and spun into silk yarn that made beautiful blankets. There were no wild herds of horses, but each family owned several saddle ponies and a team for the wagon. These animals grazed on the 
herbage, herbage of nearby slopes, but all were brought to the home corrals at night. Although there were not many coyotes on this side of the mountains, there was danger from occasional cougar and bear were numerous. In Avalo country, a bear is seldom killed, but cougars are hunted down with all possible speed. If tracks of this big cat are seen around the corrals or watering places, the best hunters arm themselves and start in pursuit with an experienced tracker in the lead. This family owned no dogs that would follow the trail of a dangerous animal, but they did not need dogs. Navajo trackers are perhaps the best in the world, and once started on a trail, there would be no pause until the quarry was located. The Navajo man who killed a cougar could claim its hide, which could be tan and used to make a quiver for his hunting arrows and thongs to tie medicine bundles. The other hunters took sinew, harp, and fangs, while each member of the party had one cougar claw to hang on a string around his neck, indicating that he killed one cougar. It was a mighty hunter who could wear a whole necklace of cougar claws. Black and brown bears were numerous among the mountain cliffs, where they wintered in deep caves and wandered the slopes in summer to live on berries, fat tree grubs, acorns, and pinyon nuts. The, the Navajos gathered with, gathered, regarded them with almost as much respect as they gave their human neighbors, killing them only, only when necessary to save a life or to protect their flocks. Under no condition would a Navajo eat a bite of bear meat. One young Navajo remarked, I wouldn't eat bear meat. I would be chewing on the spirit of one of my ancestors. The bear is a totemic animal often mentioned by myth and legend. Many chants and sand paintings are given in its honor. Claw saw his first bear on a ride up a thickly wooded ravine. Two young brown bears were, were clawing on a rotten log lying across the ditch to peel the bark and expose the white grubs underneath. His pony scented the animals and would have run away, but he held it still and soon saw, soon saw the cause of the fright. Since his pony had made quite a clatter, the bear must have known he was there, but they paid no attention, paid no heed to him, and kept diligently on the task of finding food. Claw knew several of the bear songs, which he now chanted to secure their god will, will before riding back the way he had come. Claw spent much time riding along the mountain slopes and up the canyons. One afternoon, he was exploring one of these canyons. He discovered the mouth of a cave high in the cliffs above him, leaving his horse tied to a brush. He carefully worked his way up the steep wall of the rock until he finally came to a narrow ledge that furnished a trail to the cave. Its mouth was partially blocked with loose stones and tangled brush and rubble from above, so he approached with care to keep from causing another rock slide. He knew there was no snakes at this high altitude and the bears were out of hibernation now, but there might be a mountain lion, lioness with kittens, noting a wide ledge above the opening. He found another path they climbed, clambered up to it. Lying flat on his stomach, he could peer over the edge and view the whole interior of the cave. When his eyes had become accustomed to its dim, dimness, he could see that it was wide and roomy, but not very deep, being somewhat the shape of a flattened pottery bowl with no sharp corners on the floor, was a curious assortment of objects which, objects which could be hardly named because of the thick coat of dust that which blanketed them and dimmed the outlines. Three large pottery jars were easily identified because of their shape, rolls of what might be buckskin or buffalo pelts lay besides them. The coils of ceremonial baskets appeared dimly, but to the other mounds and bundles he could give no name. The most surprising and awe-inspiring sight of all of, of all was the painted figures on the wall. The surface of these walls must have been smoothed by hand to make a canvas for all the mortals in the Yebiche pantheon. There stood the talking god, the house god, the rainmaker, the fire god, the humpback twins, the warrior and his brother, uh, Ye'e Baka and Ye'e Bada, and four Flint people all marching in solemn procession around the walls clothed in elaborate ceremonial costumes. The color 
the colors of which were bright and clear as day they were painted. He was too overcome to do more than clamber down the cliff, mount his pony and find his way home. His uncle was in, in excited, was as excited about his discovery as Claw had been. And the next morning they both rolled up to the canyon to the cave after clearing away some loose stones that had once formed a wall to conceal the mouth of the cave and tossing out the brush, they finally stepped inside. The floor was smooth and sandy. The walls were about twice their own height and the ceiling arched smoothly above the pottery and bundles occupied one third of the floor space near the rear wall while other objects were scattered about. The painted figures stared at them through slits in their ceremonial mask. Do you think this is a clay where the Anasazi buried their dead? Claw asked his uncle who was studying each object carefully or is it the burial of the Navajo medicine man? If it is uh, not, it is not of the old ones, his uncle answered, for they did not know the Yebiche gods and I see no sign of a burial anymore. Carefully, he fanned the dust from the huge jars and found them to be unsealed. Whatever corn, seeds, or water had been stored here had long since disappeared. He touched a bundle that evidently had either eagle or turkey feathers, and a cloud of dust came up to choke him. They were now just a bundle of quills. The medicine bundles rolled in buckskin did not touch, for he knew they would crack into bits if disturbed. One small flint arrow had claw picked out of the dust and showed his uncle, I would like to keep this as a good luck piece if you think it would be right to do so. His uncle nodded. It will be all right if it was not in any medicine bundle. This was the first piece of medicine equipment claw owned and he prized it as long as he lived, considering it powerful because it was so old. They walked around to view the painted figures and Claw bent his mind to, to memorizing the characters. Their costumes, masks, and all the articles that were carried in the hands along with the sequence of colors. He had seen the same figures at Yebiche, in Yebiche sand paintings, but these seemed more complete and more elaborate, the decorated. His uncle said some medicine man who was afraid his ceremony would be forgotten, spent much time in the cave, smoothing the wall and painting these figures. It may have been before the trip to the Bosque Redondo. And when he knew he would have to go, he brought his medicine bundles and all of the things he could not carry with him to hide in this cave. He built a wall to close the opening and then probably camouflage it with loose rubble and brush, fully intending to recover them on his return, but he did not return. That may be uh, the way it was, answered Claw, or the medicine man who left things. These things may have thought he was leaving something for posterity, but because he had not given them to anyone or told a relative where to find them, they were still his personal property. As surely as though they had been buried in the grave beside him, no Navajo would ever touch them and they would never again be used in a Yavijiri ceremony. Let us build up the stones to cover the opening, his uncle suggested, and we better not tell anyone about this cave or we might be accused of handling a dead man's property. Claw shivered. He wanted nothing to do with black magic and he was glad he had touched nothing around the bundles, but he never forgot the tall painted figures of the immortals. This Apache uncle was a medicine man who knew all and held the Chij in La Chij or Apache wind chant. Although he sang this chant with Apache words, the language was so similar to the Navajos that Claw had no difficulty understanding him. After attending some of these ceremonies, which his uncle Claw could assist with much of the details of the rites and with the chanting his uncle wanted, him to study to become a wind chanter, but Claw thought he would soon be going to his own home and he knew that memorizing a ceremony would take a long time. Still, there would be no harm in learning some of it, some of it as long as he was here. And then an ancient, an accident happened which caused him to stay much longer than he had expected. While Claw was riding along the edge of a sandy arroyo, the bank gave way underneath the pony's feet and they both rolled back down to the bank 
floor of the arroyo. It was not very deep and the bottom was soft, but the pony's flying feet hit Claw several times. His collarbone was broken, two or three ribs cracked, and there was something seriously wrong with his hip, which may have been fractured, which may have been a fractured pelvis. The pony scrambles, scrambled to its feet and went home, dragging its reins, and soon his uncle came searching for Claw. They carried him home, and a messenger was sent for the aunt, who was an herb specialist. A brush shelter was built to serve as a hospital room, and in this, he, she took care of him. With bruise of tansy, yarrow, and bone set, she sought to stem his fever and ease the pain, while splints, poultices, and bandages held his arm to his side. The collarbone and the ribs healed quickly, but he still could not walk. The Apache uncle made him a pair of hash wood crutches with which to hobble about, but he stayed in the brush shelter as long as the ant re remained with him. It was during this period of invalidism uh, that Claw was, had, was discovered to be a hermaphrodite. This accident of birth placed him in a very special category among his family and his contemporaries. The Navajos believed him to be honored by the gods and to possess unusual mental capacity com combining both male and female attributes. He was expected to master all the knowledge, skill, and leadership of a man and also all of the skills, ability, and tuition of women. Claude during his lifetime lived up to these expectations in every way. After Claude was able to walk on his crutches, his Apache uncle decided to hold a wind chant over him to complete his recovery. So all preparations were made and Claw being weary of inaction helped collect the herbs, rewind and feather the prayer sticks and paint the cuthons. The wind ceremony lasted five days and five nights. Of importance were four large sand painting depicting the sun, the moon, the four wind people and the cactus, lighting arrow clouds and many other symbols subject to the influence of the wind when it had ended, Claw had memorized all of the prayers and the ritual, the body painting, and the sand paintings. All of this now belonged to him, and he could use it to hold a ceremony for a sick person if he wished, but Claw never sang the five-day chant. He chose the parts he considered to be the most powerful and condensed them into a three-day ceremony, which he was frequently called upon to use, mostly for coughs, sore throat, or chronic difficulty in breathing. And on this side of the mountains, he was not considered the best wind chanter as long as his uncle lived and could hold the chant. Claw was just his neophyte and must pay the older man part of any remuneration he received. After the wind ceremony, Claw still walked on crutches, so his uncle thought a fire ceremony, sometimes called a knife chant by the Navajos, might restore him to his former strength. The uncle did not know this ceremony, but there was an Apache medicine man living near Fort Defiance who did this elderly. Ajerkin uh, was a very primitive person with no learning outside of that of his own cult. So his rites were wild and somewhat barbarous. His chant lasted three nights and all of the activity centered around the fire or a sand painting of the sun Near morning of the third night, the fire was reduced to a bed of hot coals on which the medicine man placed four prehistoric stone spearheads, black obsidian on the east, gray blue flint on the south, yellow flint on the west, and pink agate on the north. There they were sterilized while a long prayer was in, intoned by the medicine man and repeated by the patient. Then they were set aside till they were cool enough to handle. After Claw had been given a ceremonial bath and dried with white cornmeal, the medicine man took one spearhead and quickly slashed a cross on one shoulder blade. A helper held a turtle shell cup under it to catch the spurt of blood. Another spearhead was used for the other shoulder and again, the blood was saved. This process was repeated with the other two spearheads slashing crosses on his hips from which blood also taken. I do not know what this became of this blood, but hope it was not used to mix with powders and herbs to use as medicine. These open wounds in the shape of crosses each 
about one and a half inches long were then pinched together and held in place with pitch over which Montalvo was spread claw evidently did not know what he was to be a subject to such drastic treatment to let the evil spirits out of his body and he did not approve of this way of doing it when the right prayers would have served just as well but he endured the pain without flinching and carried the cross scars all of his life this ceremony he seldom mentioned and i would never have heard of it if i had not happened to see the scars on his shoulders one afternoon it was warm in his hogan as he was burning bundles of herbs to make enough ashes for the blackening of some healing rite. and he had shed his shirt and as i entered the hogan i saw the two shoulder scars and knew they must have been made during some ceremony but although i had not attended many rites of all kinds i knew nothing of anything like this he told me about the apache medicine man and the fire ceremony about the apache stressing the fact that the navajos did not have a barbaric ceremonies as the apaches he said it was this kind of thing that navajos had gotten away from when they separated from the apaches to form a more peaceful nation they had divided their ceremonies the apaches taking the sun dance the boys initiation ceremonies the scalp dance the wind chant the war dance the devil dance the navajo kept their own version of some of these but practice no bloodletting or self-torture the early navajo seemed to have been in closer touch with the culture of the puebloans than had the apaches and had adopted more of the puebloan religion which included the elaborate in beautiful peace chants for healing and for blessing while the Apache clung to the more primitive rites. Not long after the ceremony, Claus' uncle who sang the hell chant came to stay a few days to gather willow wands, lily root, hollow cane grass, and bulrush pollen for ceremonial uses. It did not take long to collect all he could carry in when he was ready to start for home. Claw packaged his belongings, which now included many medicine articles his Apache uncle had given him and accompanied him, accompanied him on the homeward journey. Claw's mother, a son associate, had sent word for him to come home for she needed his help with the shearing and marketing of the wool. Since he was now in his teens, it would be expected to fill a man's place in the family economy. It was midsummer, and since they had no need to hurry, the journey through the mountains was slow and pleasant. On his way, the two stopped often to pick berries or to gather the leaves and roots of some plant they thought the aunt could use. They made several, several short detours to visit the friends who were living in the summer homes among the spruce and pinyon trees, so it was not long after word spread across the eastern mountainside that Claw was on his way home, now an accredited Winchester. Okay, that's the conclusion of chapter nine, Life with an Apache Uncle. Uh, hope you enjoy uh, this book. Again, you can purchase this on Amazon. Uh, thank you for listening.